Okay, welcome to this session of Monday Night Metrics. Really appreciate everyone's attendance. And I'm very excited because over the last six months, I've been getting a lot of emails and LinkedIn messages and phone calls from founders saying, you know, we're not a product-led growth company, but we're seeing that enterprise values can be 30, 40% higher for a product-led growth company versus a more traditional go-to-market motion. And I thought, well, who better to talk about the metrics and benchmarks on product-led growth than our special guest today, who just recently conducted a, I think it's your multi, I don't know how many you've done, Sam, but maybe four or five of your product-led growth metrics and benchmarks report. Sam Crow Richard, welcome to Monday Night Metrics. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, Ray. I really appreciate it. Maybe before we get started with the content, you can just give a little background on OpenView and kind of your affinity for product-led growth. Yeah, so I'll give you a little bit of background about OpenView because my role there could be a little bit complicated as well. Um, so OpenView is a Boston-based venture capital firm. We we invest in what we consider to be expansion stage companies, so companies who have a strong product market fit, but who are really looking to scale their go-to-market and and really build their business. So anywhere between you know one to ten million in ARR. This is the the numbers group. I'm on the growth team, which is rare in venture. Um, a lot of venture capital firms might have some sort of talent arm or a marketing arm or things like that. But OpenView puts a lot of resources towards enabling our portfolio companies of which we only make around five or so investments per year to really scale. So we, uh, myself, I'm on the team as sort of the, the product led growth person on the growth team. Um, I'm also on, on a team with Kyle Boyer, who I believe has been on the show before, who is a, a real wizard when it comes to pricing, et cetera. Um, we also have a capital markets team that really helps with benchmarking and those sorts of things. For, for financial operators in the portfolio. We have a talent team and we have an ecosystem team. So we really like to give a bear hug to our portfolio companies. Um, and my team in particular, we work almost as consultants, um, sort of like an in-house McKinsey to, to help our, our portfolio companies tackle really large issues such as adding a freemium motion or figuring out what their activation metric is, et cetera. And I, I yeah. sort of came into OpenView because um, I was... The head of marketing at a company called Dispatch, and I was given very little budget. And the, you know, my job was actually to get hundreds of thousands of service providers on our platform, which was a free tool. So you'd think it'd be straightforward. So I ended up owning a lot of different parts of outside of marketing. So outside of messaging, I was owning a lot of product strategy, a lot of customer success, et cetera. And at the time, I didn't realize that was called product-led growth when you're actually using the product to get people to use the product. But in turn, I discovered OpenView and discovered what I was doing was product-led growth. So now I get to help folks start, you know, their product-led journey every single day. Great. Well, let's get into it. And why don't we start with a little trip down memory lane? Awesome. Well, so luckily, usually when I'm, I'm doing this presentation, folks may not remember, you know, how we used to sell software, but, you know, you guys probably do remember used to sell directly into the CIO. It was a huge upfront purchase, usually happened over steak dinners and on the golf course. And it required, you know, a very long implementation period required a lot of training of individuals who'd end up using it. And sometimes it caused a lot of frustration. So Salesforce, a few others really sort of piloted the cloud model where you were selling directly into an executive. So like maybe a CRO or, or a CMO or something like that on a recurring plan. And a lot of that selling motion started to take place over the phone or over email and those sorts of things. So that's how we got into content marketing, et cetera. And today we're, we're starting to see much stronger adoption at the end user level. So folks like myself who are not necessarily in charge of a budget or a software purchasing line item can start picking up a software and using it every single day. So I like to give Zoom as an example because my mother-in-law during the height of COVID was using Zoom as you know, a way to connect with her friends and have cocktail parties. Um, so we call that the end user driven era. Um, any sort of end user can start picking up software and getting value out of it and paying for it eventually too. Um, so from a pricing perspective, we start to see this like premium motion and then also usage-based pricing um, where folks are actually only paying for what they're getting. And we call that product like growth. Okay, let's kind of transition a little bit to how the, the process differs, especially from an end user's preference perspective. Yeah, so when we think about those two first models that I was talking about, and a lot of folks are still operating on those models, a lot of public companies are still doing exceptionally well on those models. 
you don't typically see product interaction from those users until a POC or until some sort of contract has been signed. Um, so, uh, you know, even Salesforce is actually set up for this type of selling motion today, um, where someone's actually not interacting with the opportunity until they're a well vetted opportunity. But now we have this end user era where folks are coming in and they're trying out software way before they buy it. And that's really changed how folks like myself, go to market experts, you know, we, we think and we work. So, you know, folks are, are going through this discovery process and they're starting to try the software before they've ever spoken to anyone from the organization. Eventually, they're going to need to activate in the product or see value in it and be retained and keep on using it way before they convert and way before they scale and expand with the product itself. So it's really sort of flipped the motion on its head. And I speak with a lot of marketing professionals and sales professionals who are top in their field, but who really struggle to, to understand how to adjust to this new buyer journey. Well, let's get into the thing that Ben and I love to do on Monday Night Metrics, and that is let's talk about some metrics. So first of all, kind of what is the reality of the adoption of product-led growth and how has it trended over the last few years? Yeah. So when I first started OpenView, I started um, doing a lot of surveying and benchmarking on whether or not people are adopting product-led growth. Product-led growth is hard to define. I think a lot of people see it as a free version or a free motion. And I, at its core, that's, that's the most simplistic way. Um, so that's how I measure it here. But I'm seeing you know, a lot more older, more established companies are adopting product-led growth as a way to, to get into new markets and to get new users. And I feel like COVID and all of us working from home has actually exacerbated that. So I use ServiceNow, New Relic, and New Nix as examples because they've actually gone public with saying, hey, we're going to embrace this freemium usage-based motion. And we're seeing that much more at sort of a very large publicly traded enterprise level. Now, Sam, one of the things that I was looking at just the other day was enterprise value to next 12 months forward-looking revenue multiples, and specifically for product-led growth companies versus non-product-led growth. And if I'm not mistaken, in Q2 of 21, there was like a, a 30 to 40% premium on that multiple for product-led growth. Uh, are you mm -hmm. seeing the same thing in kind of private company valuations? Oh man, Ray, private company valuations are really wild right now. <laughs> but yes, I am seeing that premium on product led businesses. So one of the things that I've been tasked with is figuring out how to identify strong product led businesses, even before they turn on that revenue engine, because it's easy to see this even early on and even before they turn on pricing and even before they turn on any sort of monetization. Um, and that's honestly at the point at which most investors need to capture them at this point. And so yes. Yeah. Ben, I know you're doing a lot of advisory work now and you have quite a few um, clients in your portfolio. Are you seeing any change in momentum or presence of product-led growth in your customer base and just the people you talk to from the SaaS CFO? You know, I think, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of different pricing models, you know, now, right, so the old day, it's almost like the old days of just subscription only. You know, now you see hardware usage, transaction, all sorts of things. And, and uh, you know, lots of different re revenue streams to manage, whether they're PLG or not. And, and I had actually a question, Sam mentioned, you know, like recognizing a PLG company, you know, and, and I don't know if there are other, you know, investors, you know, on the line today, but are there certain things that Sam, that it's like, oh, that's a, a flag right there. It's like, oh, they're kind of PLG or trending that way. Mm hmm yeah. So, I, I mean, the first thing is obviously that you can try the product before you buy it. So, I mean, a lot of people will try and step into that with a, a trial model, but it's truly like, can someone get any sort of value out of your product without talking to someone? And that's really challenging because, you know, a lot of people are building and they have all of this context in their head. But ultimately, like the most simple products, for example, Calendly, who's an OpenView portfolio company, really have the strength because they're very straightforward to understand and to try before you buy and to get value out of before you buy. So I actually help the investment team in evaluating the product itself mm -hmm. because I truly believe you have to evaluate the product itself to know if someone is product led at their core or if they're making that transition, which is fine, but it's certainly a lot more work. Okay, well... Let's talk a little bit about, are there certain segments that are a little more prevalent to use PLG or can we all like look at it and think about having a product that's PLG led? Yeah. Well, so my focus is strongly on infrastructure and developer software. So like the data dogs, the Twilio's of the world. And that's where I tend to see more of this adoption. I think a lot of it, you know, sort of comically is because developers don't want to talk to people. They want to try a product. 
um, certainly before they commit to using it in their stack fully. And as a result, this market has to has to move much more quickly and they have to be much more innovative in terms of capturing that market. Um, one thing that I find really fascinating is the movement from security tools from being very isolated and sort of very traditionally led to being more product led. So I like to think of like the sneaks of the world. Axonius is a company in our portfolio. Intizer is a company in our portfolio that are, are moving towards a product led motion because they're speaking to more security experts who want to see and touch and feel a product before they get on the phone with sales. Horizontal applications, I think, are what people typically think of as product-led. So a Slack, a Salesforce, a Calendly. Um, you know, Salesforce even has a free motion as well. And one thing that I think is a little bit lagging is vertical applications. And I feel like a lot of that, too, similar to developers, is because of that persona. They're used to being sold to. They're used to having demos. And they're used to being coached through software. Um, so I think that will change as well. Sam, just to make sure we all understand, when it says 49% above the horizontal application stack, is that mm -hmm. 49% of the companies that you surveyed who were horizontal apps Correct. had a PLG motion? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, what are some of the complications? There are a lot. So when you're focusing on the end user, all of your metrics change. Um, you start focusing on actual product performance. Like when I read S1s and I read sort of public companies and the metrics that they announced, you know, obviously a lot of that are the things that you guys and your team study. Um, but I, I, I have, I've started to see more of a rise of the understanding of product in these announcements. But when you have a product led motion and you have this very wide net to capture people with, it's going to start to make those metrics that you're used to, to publicly posting actually look worse. So if you think about, you know, conversion or those sorts of things, like, a really positive conversion rate for me from, you know, a free sign up to conversion completely is like between five and 7%, which for the market is like a little shocking. Um, and it, it can be really tough for those companies to adjust unless they have those benchmarks at their disposal. I know we're going to talk a lot more about that. And this whole metric around activation is something that I never thought about in a sales led motion. So, but let's talk about activation and how difficult this metric is because from my understanding is almost every product may have a different definition of what activation is, and it might be at a different point in the life cycle. Is that right, Sam? Absolutely. So activation is like not a one size fits all metric. And it's highly specific, not only to your product itself, but also the persona of the person who's signing up. So, I mean, take Dropbox as an example. Um, you know, there's, there are multiple ways to get into Dropbox. You can be an invited user. You can be someone who Googles them and finds it or those sorts of things. Um, so they actually have different activation metrics for the way that someone comes in. Or if you think about your product getting stronger and, you know, not just being like sort of this horizontal one click play, you're going to have to change your activation metric over time. So activation can be tough. Activation is that aha moment where a user finds any sort of value whatsoever in your product. And it's, it has to be defined by the product organization and it has to be used widely by the other parts of the organization. And it has to be correlated to conversion and it has to be correlated to positive business outcomes, but oftentimes it occurs way, way before those events um, in that user journey. And that's important. So what you're saying is this activation point, some people I've heard refer to it as the aha moment where the user says, ah, I've got to use this. Is it typically before someone converts from a free or freemium product to a paid account? Yes, I would say that's a must have. A lot of the, the data that I had in my benchmarking report that I sort of threw out is that people are measuring activation as converting to a free version of something. But you're not truly a product led product unless you're getting some value for free. So, you know, for Slack, it's connecting with that first user and having that first conversation. Um, and returning. And you can do all of that for free. You don't necessarily need to have converted. And you might never, ever convert, um, which is one of the scary things about this metric as well. So if activation is one of the first metrics that you track, and we're going to talk about conversion from website visitor to a free product engagement or sign up, et cetera, in just a minute. So if activation is such a critical metric, because it lets you look at our people, what's the probability of converting to a paid account, I would think 100% of PLG companies are actually tracking that activation rate and know what that aha moment is. Is that true, Sam? Not at all. 
Um, not at all. I think that this is, yeah, this is still one of the, the lesser known metrics. And actually when an, a product led company signs up to be a portfolio company of OpenViews, take the check from us. That's one of the first things I do is roll up my sleeves and confirm that they have an activation metric and confirm that we feel it's accurate. I have spoken to many public company operators at strong product led businesses who don't necessarily have this yet. So activation can be tough. They, they can drive you a little bit crazy as well. And then, you know, this, this is actually more on retention. Um, and I like to think about retention as user retention, not necessarily revenue retention. Um, but if you take a look at this, in sales-led models, you can expect people to be retained by the product and they're actively using it because they've had this white glove experience before they're ever in the product. Um, but in free motions, we see much, much lower retention because people are able to come in and out for free and not have to talk to anyone. And there's sort of way less skin in the game, so to speak. Um, so we actually see pretty horrific retention rates and then conversion rates, uh, respectively, by model. On this slide here, before we go to the activation rates slide, what this says is in a traditional sales-led motion, we know we're going to be close to 20% conversion from the time they're in the opportunity funnel to a closed paying account. Is that right, Sam? Is mm -hmm. that what this says? Yeah, exactly. And then in this product-led motion, if you get 5%, 4 to 5% of your customers actually converting from being a user of the product to a paid account, that would be at the median, is that correct? Correct. Okay, good. perfect. And yeah. please, audience, if you have any questions, please type those in the chat. But this, when I saw this, I was shocked. You're telling me that only 45% of companies that use PLG as their customer acquisition motion measure activation and it's not changing? I mean, this was the entire cohort. So this is not necessarily just in PLG, but I still see pretty low rates as well. I think a lot of it is the fact that there is not a tool for this. You have to like sort of shake down your data. You have to have an analyst. You have, a, have to have people who look at it from both a commercial and a product perspective. And frankly, Ray, those people are unicorns. They're very hard to find. And we're already in one of the worst hiring markets I've ever seen. So um, I think a lot of it is that. I think a lot of it is also the fact that people have transitioned really quickly to product-led models who didn't necessarily have that DNA and who have sort of a lot of not necessarily tech debt, but ops debt and metrics debt that they're working to to, to fix as well. So I'm excited about a lot of new products that are coming to market that say that they will help you find this activation metric, but I'm still holding my breath to see if that can truly happen. And for our audience out there who's thinking about product-led growth as a go-to-market motion, do you think it's almost imperative that a product analytics infrastructure is put in place before you actually start the investment in marketing to try to bring in PLG-based customers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like it depends on if you're doing paid marketing or if you're trying to do organic and sort of like developer relations, et cetera. But I've seen a lot of um, organizations will have marketing without any analytics in place. And then they think that they're driving all of these leads. But in reality, the leads turn from the product in a week or, or something like that. Or, you know, they have terrible outcomes and they actually interact with the product itself. Um, so I typically feel that product analytics should be in place. But I also see an overcorrection in the market where people take a look at too many data points and get incredibly overwhelmed by product analytics. So I always say, figure out what your five most common touch points are with every single user who comes to your product. What's that user journey look like? And keep curating it and having very, very few things that you actually look at on a day-to-day -day basis. Ben, let me ask, ask you this question as a SaaS CFO. Mm -hmm. Your product team comes to you and says, yeah, we're kind of stalled at 5 million ARR, but we got this great idea to introduce product-led as a new customer acquisition motion. But before we do that, we need to spend, uh, I'm going to throw out $100,000 a year on a great product analytics tool to really understand what that buyer journey is and whether we should continue to invest more in marketing. What do you think about that investment up front? Well, I, you know, I think, right, that's smart. You have to have the infrastructure to track this stuff, but then it'd be, you know, okay, the tool is great, but then, all right, what are we doing to the product? How much is that going to cost? You know, what's the return for that? You know, you know, working with the sales team too, has that, does that change our go-to-market motion? You know, so I think it's, it's collaboration with the company to understand, you know, the investment in the dev team and the output, does that change our pricing? You know, and then on the back end, it's like, okay, yeah, we need this product analytics tool to track all that. 
Well, let's get into some of the deep metrics here. So Sam, as we go through the next three or four pages, I'm going to throw a lot of questions at you, but what is this particular um, benchmark saying? So this benchmark is talking about, you know, whether or not folks are act- actively measuring activation and then what their activation rate is. So this is just, this is answering the question, are you measuring activation? Yes or no. So it's 54% in 2021 in the cohort of folks that we asked. So 54% in the 2021 timeframe was measuring activation. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important because there's two different types of PLG type pricing models for that first point of engagement, freemium versus free trial. So can you explain that and how it could impact your expectations for activation? Yeah. So we're actually seeing um, people with a free trial model uh, get to that activation rate or have a higher activation median rate um, than folks with the freemium product. Again, I think it's a little bit more skin on the line. I think that time boxing really helps folks say, I'm going to commit to this product and I'm going to find the value in it or I'm going to churn. Um, So we actually do tend to see higher activation rates for free trial approaches. I don't necessarily think free trial approaches are the best for everyone, but if you want to sort of juice your numbers and make sure that you're getting a lot of this up front, um, it's, it's very clear from the data, both from this year and last year, that a free trial approach is the best way to go. And I'm sure the answer is going to be it depends, but is there a specific time frame for a free trial that increases activation rates? Like, is it 30 days? Is it 60 days? What are you seeing, Sam? Is there any trend there? It really depends on your vertical, but if it's anything longer than 30 days, to me, it's a joke. I like to see between 7 and 14, but I think for a more complicated product, um, we'd like to see 30, but it gives you a lot of play when you start with 17 or 14. Then you can extend that trial and you can have those po- folks interact with you. So I like to start shorter and then offer that for folks who are more likely to be engaged or more likely to need help. And I know it's not on this particular report, but one of the things I think a lot of companies are struggling with is, well, what should my outreach strategy be to a freemium user, especially, right? Mm-hmm. They signed up on their own. Should I send them marketing emails? Should I, based upon what they do in the product? So are you finding there's any benchmarks on the number of times an organization should reach out to a freemium product that optimizes the conversion to a paid account? Yeah. So actually last year, um, we found that people with a lot more touch points were more successful. Um, Part of this is staying top of mind and having the right message at the right time. So we saw 11 plus touch points actually corresponded to a much higher overall conversion rate, um, which sounds like a lot. But if you're doing them over the course of two weeks and some is about learning and some is about marketing and some is direct sales outreach, that's actually not a ton. And you'll be surprised at how many folks really just sort of don't do any sort of out, like any sort of topical like product related outreach of like where you are in the product and where you need to go next there's not a lot of telemetry there and that goes back to Ben's comment about you know making that that initial investment in product analytics is really valuable because you can actually set marketing campaigns you can set sales campaigns off of it and generate things like product qualified leads and start to send folks who are really interested in the product over to sales or to segment them into specific drip campaigns to really juice that conversion number higher. And that's a really interesting question, Ray. You know, Sam, are these PLG driven like triggers, what they're doing, the product shoots out an email mm-hmm. and or or marketing campaigns, which may not be tied to what they're doing in the product. I mean, what? Yeah, like, it was so all that's a above. really interesting nuance. Yeah, yeah like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing it's marketing if you're doing something. Hey, just do have a marketing cadence. But then, hey, if you're a little more advanced, we actually have triggers in the product that send something out to the to the user. Yeah, it's all of the above. It's still really rare to see true triggering. And so I don't think we're there yet. So I wouldn't be able to segment that off on their own. But my hypothesis is that the right message at the right time is going to get people to return better. Just given like the the way that I respond to um, like updates on my phone or those sorts of things that are really relevant to me. So I'd like to see the B2B market move in that direction as well. Okay, well, we've been talking a lot about activation, but I'm a big top of the funnel kind of data geek. It's like, I want to know if people come to my website, you know, how many of those become leads, how many of those become customers. I think that's what we're going to talk about next. And so tell me a little bit about what you found here with website visitors. Once again, it's an important metric and what percentage of those Mm -hmm. actually convert into a free account. Is that really a critical top of the funnel metric in PLG? 
Absolutely. I mean, the wider your funnel is, the wider your net is, um, the more, first of all, product experiments you can run, which is really my favorite thing. But it also means you're going to have more folks converting, all things being equal. So, you know, one of the things that I like to call out to everyone is that when you have a freemium or a free trial motion, you're going to have like at least twice the amount of signups. Um, you know, some might be a waste of your time, but it's a really good free demand generation activity at, at a minimum. But what we saw here is that high growth companies growing at 100% or more, you know, at the median are, are getting more and more folks to, to sign up for their product. Um, and, you know, a difference of between four and 5% might seem small, but if you're working with thousands and thousands of users, that's a lot of signups. Interesting. So then you go to that free account to paid account. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm pretty surprised here. It seems low. Yeah, I mean, these numbers are, these numbers actually seemed high to me, given the, the caliber of the companies that I work with and the public companies that I worked with and asking them about their free to paid conversion. But this felt really high, but it, it sort of reflects the fact that, you know, these high growth companies have a larger top of funnel, and they're more able to convert, you know, a larger group of folks. So that's why they're higher growth from a revenue perspective. You see, my perspective is from a sales-led motion. So I, mm -hmm. once again, I automatically go to what? It's not 20%. Yeah. Let, let me ask you another question about this. We're going to throw it over to Ben too. So we've talked on Money Night Metrics about customer acquisition costs, CAC ratio, CAC payback period. Do I, at this point in time, calculate a, a CAC ratio when they first become a paid customer? Because it seems like it might be much higher. So tell us a little bit about how you measure cost at this point in time for a PLG acquired account? Yeah. Um, well, so one of the things that it's it's hard for me to, to actually say with a lot of companies I'm working with is that ratio because lifetime value is hard to prove. Because if you look at the net dollar retention and the net retention rates of products like companies, especially publicly traded ones, they retain really well. Like think about Netflix. Are you ever going to churn off of Netflix? Maybe I shouldn't ask you that. But, you know, just generally this audience, like most of us are customers for life. Um, and a lot of product led tools have that too. So what we instead look at is the CAC payback period. And we like to see that stay less than a year, but it really depends on the product too and the ACV, et cetera. Even in product led growth, mm -hmm. right? And I'm inherently thinking in the first year, they're not going to be as high as ARR as someone who signs up for the minimum. Mm -hmm. you're, you're saying that still it could be up to 12 months of a CAC payback period. You're not expecting two, three, four months CAC payback period the way you would in a consumer business? No, no. And I mean, again, it depends on how much that customer is spending. If it's like a $2 a month product, it's very different. But if you look at like usage-based pricing, I mean, a lot of the folks who signed up early days for Twilio and Datadog were $0 accounts and then very, very quickly ramped up to be in the six figures um, annually. So um, that usage-based pricing is not the CIO's favorite or the CFO favorite because he has to, you know, he's never going to really know how to forecast that, but it looks really great from an investment perspective. We have a question here, um, and I'm not sure if this is something that you've studied or you work on at OpenView, but does the freemium versus free trial approach in the metrics change in B2B versus B2C? So I'm only starting to study like consumerized software. I don't like to call it B2C because B2C reminds me a lot of like e-commerce. But I, I do see high success with free trials. I've been speaking with product folks over at Tinder and Duolingo, et cetera, which is really what do you think about consumerized software? That's definitely a big one. I see they use free trial more often, but that's because their their cost of acquisition is much higher. And they have to they have to work for like Apple Store algorithms and mobile store algorithms and those sorts of things. And giving those algorithms the conversion point that's pretty early on is very good. Um, I believe that this is public, but Tinder's like conversion rate from trial to paid is like something like 40% um, within the first day. So it's very, very strong. But they're, they're juicing a lot of those numbers by running a lot of very sophisticated experiments because they just have this massive, massive group of people on which to do it. One thing I would add to that is mm -hmm. I have used free trial periods quite mm -hmm. often in the B2B SaaS industry. And what we found had a very high correlation to conversion to paid was a shorter time frame, 30 days versus 90 days, and that there are true criteria of success during that free trial period that 
you know, if you're actually investing any resources all for that free trial period, that these are the three or four things. And if it's not a human resource at all investing in that free trial, that you have those product usage triggers going out because you know if they don't use this, this, and this feature, your conversion rate is much lower and they need to use that as right. soon as possible. Do you, Sam, do you kind of look at that correlation of time-based, usage-based, and the correlation to conversion? Absolutely. So one of the things that I'll always start looking at when I'm thinking about activation is if they use this feature, does that change? And once in a while, we'll really find a standout feature where if they use it, you know, their propensity to convert is like 9x whether or not they don't. So that actually really changes product design and development. So, you know, you have to prioritize that feature over everything else when you're onboarding someone and teaching them to use the tool. So you have to prioritize that in product onboarding and visibility and design. You have to get your CS team to get people to use that feature. And to me, that's really the fun part of my job. Yeah, and as a the sound CFO, I have this question for you. All this sounds like we used to have at executive team meetings, you had the head of marketing and head of sales and maybe the head of customer success talking about conversion metrics and revenue metrics, et cetera. To me, this sounds like the head of product and even the head of engineering needs to be in that discussion now. So first of all, Ben, you know, is that from your experience? Is Are they now going to be held to revenue and conversion to paid customer metrics? Yeah, that'd be interesting, right? But I would expect, at least on the analytics side, that the product team would be coming forward with metrics and how customers are moving through that product. Again, that customer journey and what's happening because right there heavily vested to understand how our customers using it and what are those activation points, what makes them successful. So, you know, the, the revenue side is really interesting. You're always pushing sales and marketing. Uh, it would have been fun with some of my prior CTOs to put a revenue target to them. Uh, <laughs> you know, that'd be a different conversation. Uh, but yeah, you know, I've had, you know, heads of product who, yeah, they want that revenue, those revenue numbers. As soon as I close the books, hey, what's my revenue by product line every month, right? And they, they whether PLG or not, I feel like, yeah, they should they should be understanding how, how revenue is trending within their product lines. Let me ask you this question. We One of the metrics that we've talked about on here and how to calculate it is, as you mentioned, CAC payback period, but also CAC ratio. But just CAC itself, what goes into customer acquisition costs? Typically, it's sales and marketing expenses. Are you seeing any of your portfolio companies that are PLG-led putting mm -hmm. any product or product management costs into CAC? Not yet, but I have had many conversations in taxis over this um, because I strongly feel that you should because I almost feel like product-led companies are sort of they're I don't want to say cheating um, but they're not being fully transparent when the product itself or the product professionals themselves are fully focused on growth and how to develop more of a broader audience um, and they're not sort of bringing those folks into the sales and marketing budget so it's not apples to apples when you're comparing public SaaS organizations I'm hopeful that in the next year or two, we're going to start seeing that publicly reported, but I don't think that there's any reason to do so yet um, because it's not necessarily a standard, but I'd love to hear what Ben thinks about that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's where it gets hard because, right, that's changing the fundamental framework of these SAS mm -hmm. metrics, which makes it so difficult. And then everyone's doing it differently. Uh, so I think this is, we're not even to that frontier yet of changing frameworks. But yeah, I think it's really interesting where now internally we have to talk to our teams, talk to products. You know, you think about the product team, where you spend your time, hey, it's tech debt, it's new features, it's monetization, all this stuff. And there could be that new bucket now of now we're thinking about uh, the PLG side. Mm -hmm. Sam, even though this wasn't part of what we're supposed to talk about, I am. Um, I think it's really important because we all, when we think about cost allocation, we also think about which organizations are involved. And now mm -hmm. we have customer success. So in the PLG-led model, who mm -hmm. is primarily responsible as far as the outreach and product engagement, et cetera, for that conversion? Is it sales? Is it customer success? Is it product? Is it's too early to tell which one owns it most of the time? Do you see any trends there? Oh, it's sales. It's still very much sales, especially for new business. I'm still seeing like some some really interesting stuff being done later on in terms of expansion and adoption of new features, which tend to be paid features. 
by customer success, but I think about, you know, sort of the DNA of those users and why you actually want to get out of them or those employees and what you want to get out of them. I want customer success to, to drive engagement within my accounts so that they love the product and they never, ever churn from it. I want sales to, to keep selling because that's really what they're best at. I've met a lot of customer success professionals who are just not strong sales folks. Um, so their win rates might be much smaller, even though they're a cheaper, cheaper investment. Um, mm. You know, ultimately you have to let sales sell. Um, and that's what I'm seeing really strongly. But, you know, I think that there will be outlier companies where that's different, um, but none of the ones that I'm seeing publicly or privately. Okay, well, let's move on. So product qualified leads. Now, for those of you who have had any experience with marketing qualified leads and what the conversion rate is to a sales qualified lead or a qualified opportunity, you know there might be some openness to debate on what's truly an MQL. What is this PQL thing? And is that going to change the um, confidence in the conversion rates from a qualified lead to a qualified opportunity? Yeah, so just so everyone's aware, product qualified leads are very new. Um, so that's just sort of bringing the telemetry into what someone's doing about um, the product, is, like what someone's doing in the product and bringing that to sales and saying, is this person likely to convert? Is this person likely to convert on their own, which is really important to me because I do not want sales reaching out to people who are going to convert on their own. Um, or does this person need extra help and what sort of help might they need? So again, similar <clears throat> to activation, we're seeing more adoption of product-led models, but we're not seeing a ton of adoption in this product-qualified lead model, um, where people are actually using product analytics and product telemetry to inform their sales so that they have stronger conversations or perhaps no conversation at all. Um, but I, I think that I will see a greater adoption of this in the market. Again, the software is not there. The people are not there. Um, so it's really challenging to set up these types of programs. So Sam, but where we have people who are measuring activation rate is, you know, up to 54% at median. I'm mm -hmm. a little surprised that using product qualified leads is only at 25% at median, when mm -hmm. isn't it some of the same infrastructure required to measure activation rate versus a product qualified lead? I did. It, it does. And I think it tells a story about the siloization between sales and product. I mean, they've always sort of been at odds with each other, even in sales led motions. Um, you know, sometimes sales is the whipping boy of product, sometimes it's vice versa. Um, and I think activation is very much sort of a growth and product managed number and metric. But to me, PQLs is someone reaching across the aisle and saying, like, here's some data and it's really going to help you sell. And I'm not seeing that sort of sportsmanship here. By the way, one of the things I wanted to add on PQLs mm -hmm. is it's not just product utilization information. You're going to want to marry that with your ideal customer profile, firmographic and technographic information. Because even if someone's really using the product, but they're in a cohort that you know has a much lower revenue potential or much lower conversion potential, it seems like you want to prioritize your outreach. Would you agree with that, Sam? Oh, absolutely. Or you want to at least automate it at some point. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the other thing I'd highlight is if, as Sam said, you still want sales pretty involved in the conversion process, getting mm -hmm. that product utilization information into a digestible, oh. understandable format for a salesperson mm -hmm. within his or her tool, the CRM, mm -hmm. to me, that mm -hmm. seems like one of the process areas that could still have some challenges. Is that right, Sam? Absolutely. And as I mentioned before, there are a lot of like newcomer product offerings that are saying that they're doing this. Um, but I tried to do this with Salesforce and there are like a lot of API limits and things like that. So I almost feel like our core product itself that we we run sales on has to change too. But I am interested to see, you know, how does this change the entire CRM landscape? And does this become another tool that sales has to adopt? Does sales like to adopt other tools? So I am mentoring a few of these companies that are getting started. There's a lot of problems in this market. Yeah, let me <clears> ask you a question about this metric here, the product mm -hmm. qualified lead, because mm -hmm. as a financial steward of the company, right, you're trying to optimize every dollar of investment. Do you think this is a, a metric that CFO should strongly encourage and get their head of marketing and product to agree upon earlier in the process? Well, yeah, I, I tend I, to think so. Well, I just feel like it can really pull forward revenue. It isn't that important to you, Ben. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I love this because, right, we have MQLs, we have SQLs, you know, now we've got, you know, PQLs in the system and flowing into our CRM and the meta, and the metadata around that, you know, are they an enterprise type customer and the sales should outreach, you know, so yeah, definitely. I see this. Yeah, just another, you know, another data flow coming into our, our pipeline. Okay, let's move on. We're going to wrap up here soon for our audience. Now we talked, here's a, I call it a metric, and that is product utilization. So what are the key product utilization metrics that a product-led growth company should be using, Sam? Well, so product utilization to me um, really is that user retention. So are they coming back after one day and using the product again? Are they coming back after a week? And are, are they coming back on 30 days? And I, I like to cohort that. And that's kind of how I can see how effective the product is and how much people love it. But one of the things that I asked is whether or not someone's measuring DAU week, weekly active use and monthly active use. And I also think that, again, this has to be really tailored to fit your product because Expensify, which is a portfolio company of ours, I only use that monthly because I, I do an expense report monthly um, and I'm still a super engaged user because I'm using it exactly the right way. But I want to be using Calendly at least weekly, if not daily. Um, so again, this has to be really tailored to you, your product and your use case. Sure, for our audience, because these colors are a little hard to understand. Uh, on the not tracking anymore, is not tracking anymore, is that the 5% or is that the 38? The 5%. 5%. So only 5% yeah. are not tracking anymore. And mm -hmm. not tracking at all is 23%, which is still very high. So 23% aren't tracking. <clears throat> That's amazing. Now, the other metric that people are hearing, or I hear thrown around a lot is Mal over Dow. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Mal, what country am I in? But what is Mal over Dow? And how predictive is that of anything? Um, I think it's Dow over Mao. It's basically like saying how many of your power users are like how many people are using it monthly versus weekly or sorry, monthly versus daily. So how many people are obsessed with it and using it daily versus how many people are using it for not something like something that's not mission critical. So they're using it week or they're using it monthly. And again, I, I feel like that that metric, if you applied it to everyone, it would not be great because some things are not necessarily mission critical. Some things you are just doing monthly expense reports in and some things you're you're constantly using. Um, so, I mean, I like it. I think it's a great, like, it's a great thing for a product manager to have and if he's looking for, um, to understand um, how passionate some of his users are versus how dispassionate other users are. But I, I feel like if you were widely to apply it to the market without understanding the nuances of the product itself, it would be it would be more harmful than positive. So this, what I'm hearing is unlike the standard SaaS metrics that Ben and I always talk about, which have withstood the test of time, 10, 15 years, right? It just seems like product-led growth metrics and the um, associated benchmarks it's going to be really hard to benchmark most of the actual usage and activation stuff, huh? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's so custom and you have to really tell a good story with it. And I think that's why a lot of times these metrics are getting ignored um, because they <clears> also <throat> can be, they can vary. Like if you're measuring product itself, there's a lot of different data points. Like revenue is a hard and fast number. Product is really nuanced and it's really hard to socialize across the organization. Um, even if you're as passionate about it as me, I've really struggled to, to socialize these new metrics across orgs. Um, and they require data that we've never had access to before and they require clean data. And um, that, that is a problem at like very large public organizations today. Um, and data can be subjective, especially when it's coming from the product itself. Got you. Well, let's wrap up here. We're at 8.48. So based upon all this research you've done, open view, and for anyone, um, and we'll get Sam's contact information out to you in just a minute, but if you want to follow about the trends and what's going on, open view by far to me is the, the um, best voice in the marketplace. But based upon all the insight and all the buzz, Sam, what's your predictions for the future? Oh, I'm seeing a lot more companies transition to, to free models or saying that they have a free model or something like that. So people are really working on it. I think that some of the commentary when we started this early on um, was clear. I get excited when I see an S1 of someone doing it. And one of the things that we do is we evaluate the cloud 100 every year and I'm starting to see greater adoption there as well. Um, so I, I think it's going to become very standard. Um, it's not for everyone. 
but uh, it is for most. So I'll, I'll say that. Do I think activation will become commonplace? I certainly hope so, because it just makes you run so much more streamlined as an organization. So much of product management is wondering what to build next. And when you have an activation metric and you have that North Star, it becomes less fuzzy. And, you know, it gives your team something to rally around. And it, especially as we go more remote, um, as, as team culture becomes harder to build, when you want to build passion around the product, activation is one way to really get there. And then what tools will gain traction? Well, I hope it's it's analytics tools, um, hopefully not homegrown, hopefully ones that you know transfer across um, different platforms. But I'm also very hopeful for this new breed of tools I'm calling PLG CRMs that really help product managers communicate better with revenue teams. For example, one is Pocus, um, one is Heads Up. Uh, there are a few others. Um, I actually wrote like a LinkedIn post about it. I guess I can send that out too. Um, because there are just so many in the market and I'm excited to see, you know, what the problems that they're solving. And do I think product will own growth? That's a really good question. I mean, it depends on how you define growth. I think growth can be part of the product, but I also think that, you know, companies like Zapier, companies like Algolia have done a really good job of productizing marketing in a way, because they were like, their marketers were engineers. Um, and they've like spun up incredible SEO that's helped them long-term, um, and, I do think that the like head of growth role will go by the wayside in the next 10 years. Um, but I don't know if it will be fully swallowed up by product or not. All right. So let me ask this question. When I see this growth marketing, VP of growth marketing. So mm -hmm. what is the difference between a VP of marketing, a VP of demand gen and a VP of growth marketing? I, you have to ask them that because titles are fluid. Like titles are very fluid. Like I started my career in demand generation for B2B and I fell in love with product. Um, and I started in paid and those sorts of things. And I realized how awful paid search is, et cetera. So I started trying to build those levers into the product and trying to engineer those levers myself. So then I became sort of obsessed with growth, but I still meet people who are heads of growth who are literally just running Google campaigns. So it really depends on the person and the organization that they're in. And before we wrap up here, you know, we talked about all these new metrics and you're one of the kind of godfathers of B2B SaaS metrics. Were there any metrics today that jumped out at you that you would advise companies considering the PLG motion that they've got to implement sooner rather than later? Yeah, I think, it, you know, it's so ambiguous right now, but I think it's starting to think about that framework around if you're PLG and those costs going in, the investment going into PLG, you know, if it's on a product team or if you have to tweak sales and marketing tools, uh, but thinking about it as that framework, because, you know, you think about CAC and, hey, what are your channels of acquisition? Well, PLG could be a major, you know, a, a major source now or, or the only source, who knows, but it's, it's what's that framework? What's your go-to-market motion? And really like the, the PLQ concept, and how does that fit into your, your pipeline and those conversion points? You know, so I think it's it's starting to put a, a framework around it, even though nothing's set yet. Uh, but how is that? How is it you know impacting your business and where you're spending your money? And when you go in to work with your portfolio companies, are there any common themes about the one or two things that most companies just don't think of or they underinvest in as they begin this PLG journey? You know, what strikes me the most, and maybe this is too granular for this audience, but I, I get the feeling that this might drive with you, is that no one's measuring on a cohort by cohort basis. Like no one's looking at, you know, the people who came in in January, how has their behavior changed, et cetera. And to me, it's just the easiest, most color-coded, most straightforward way to understand whether or not your marketing's having an impact, whether or not sales is having an impact, whether or not product's having an impact. And you can cut that data so many different ways, but everyone <coughs> just looks at it sort of like, on an on a line rather than on what I would call like a watermelon chart. And that's incredibly frustrating to me because if you start cutting the data by cohort, you can start to see the impacts that you're having, um, which is really key to product led because you're consistently making updates to the product itself. And I know I talked about how many great assets and thought leadership content that OpenView creates, Sam. So here I wanted to provide our audience a link and maybe um, we can take that link and put it in the chat if that's possible, Ben, because I really wanted people to have access to the report because there's so much great content there, Sam. Is there any other specific assets that you would recommend our listening audience to look for? Well, my colleague Sean Fanning and Kyle Poyer also put out the SaaS and financial reporting benchmarks, and that's coming out in October. So I hope you'll also look for that if you support this. 
And then obviously, you know, anything by you guys, you know, anything from RevOps squared uh, is super helpful as well. So I appreciate all of the work that you guys are doing and the way that we're able to share this information across the board. Well, thank you. Because I think just one of the great things about the SaaS and cloud industry over the last 20 years is people who go through an experience, they just want to share. They want to help the industry overall be more informed. So thank you for that. And I think what Ben does um, with all of his educational materials and his blogs, what you guys are doing, really appreciate it. And the last thing I would want people to know is how can they contact you, Sam? Is this the best place to kind of contact you and follow you? Yeah, LinkedIn's also great. Okay. Anything you want to say to our listening audience before we wrap up today? Um, if anyone has any questions about product-led growth, OpenView does like a ton of content uh, around it. So please visit our blog, but I'm also happy to speak individually as well. Yeah. Anything you want to end up with? Nope. That, that was great. I you know, really enjoyed it. A lot, of, I think for me, a lot of aha moments, you know, looking at some of these slides. So uh, yeah, I think now it's like, hey, how do you apply this to your business and make it actionable? So great stuff. Sam, thank you so much for sharing the findings in your 2021 product-led growth and product benchmarks report. Um, I love what you're doing for the industry. Ben, as always, thank you so much for being my co-host here. And most of all, to our listening audience, thank you so much. We will make the recording of this available, and I'll be on our YouTube channel within the next five days. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Take Bye care. Bye now.